everybody. Camera is rolling. I was hoping today would be a little informal and very much different. A little different would probably be too small a way to summarize it. So I was hoping today would be quite different. I was trying to think, how do you get through the rest of the history of Israel? There's no way we can do it all. But I thought, since we left off uh, with David, going through uh, some kings would be valuable. I thought it would be helpful to us to just kind of cherry pick some of the uh, kings of Israel and the kings of Judah that there were, and that maybe that would uh, give us a little bit of, uh, I guess, mental pegs or something to kind of hold on to. Um, so at the very least, if we don't get that, I I'm hoping that we get a little bit of the flavor of what happened in Israel and Judah. Uh, how many of you guys have read through uh, the Kings? And by that I mean either 1st and 2nd Kings or 1st and 2nd Chronicles or both. Okay. Yeah, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. So majority of us have been through that. And my guess is if you haven't been through that, you've probably heard lots of examples of these Kings. There are a bunch. Don't have time to go through all of them. Depending on how you count, there is um, the United Monarchy, where, where if, if we did it like a timeline, I would start over here, we would have the United Monarchy, Saul, David, Solomon. And then during the time of Solomon's son, we have a division that the monarchy divides to north and south, the ten northern tribes, which we've seen there's already animosity between north and south. You know, even in the lifetime of David, there was already set boundaries. We got the north and the south. But now, God allowed it to happen where the two just split off. And in the uh, north, you've got 19 kings. Some would even count 20. It depends on, do you count the guy that reigned for less than a month or not? <laughs> Pretty short. So, some would even say maybe 20. And then in the south, you've got 20. That's 40 kings. We don't have time to cover 40 kings in such a short amount of time. How many of the kings of the north were good kings? Uh, yeah, that many, zero, none. Not a one of the northern kings are good. In the south, out of 20, how many good kings do you have? Anyone remember? Approximately eight good kings in the south out of 20. So a total of, of, of 40 kings and only eight of them, uh, you could definitely say are godly. Not a lot of good things happened in the, uh, in the example of the kings, unfortunately. But still, a lot of, it's fun, it's fun scripture to read. It definitely is. So what I'm going to do is, you have your papers there. This, this is from a Church of Christ preacher. It was very helpful, I thought. Um, he outlined some of the foreign kings. I tried to leave blank pages on the back or wherever so you can write notes if you need to. But he's got the kings of Israel, the kings of Judah, and he's got the dates. He talks about whether they're good or bad. And he also mentions the prophets around their lifetime and references where you can find them in Scripture. So I really wanted you to have this. I prefer a nicer format, but at the very least, I wanted you to have this because this is what you can do next time you're reading through these books. You can cross-reference. You can, you can look up where these kings are and just kind of take a look at where you're going. It's very helpful to have them in chart form. And I want you to see why. Some of the names on here, If um, let's just pick on, uh, well, look at the kings of Israel first. What do we have when we get towards the end? Well, we started with Jeroboam, and then somewhere in there we have another Jeroboam. Well, that's not too helpful. And which one are you talking about, the first Jeroboam or the second Jeroboam? And then you have Pekahiah followed by Pekah at the end. The names don't get much stranger or similar, and that's where it's confusing. Now, if you go in the middle, right under, uh, just about a little bit further down the middle, you have Jehoash, who reigned. Right at the same time, in the other kingdom, you have a Joash reigning. Jehoash and Joash are not the same person. They are two different people. But, to make matters even more confusing, you have the kingdom family of the south and the kingdom family of the north marrying into each other's family. Yeah, marrying into each other's family so that they are actually in the same family for a while, and you have a Joash and a Jehoash. And, and so it's very, it, it can get very confusing, but I don't want that to, uh, to hinder you, because if you can 
look past some of those weeds for a while, or, you know, not let it hurt your brain too much. There is a lot of really rich material of, of things that happen to the kings. So the way I wanted to handle today is we'll just highlight some specific kings, and I've, I've called today the King Awards. We're going to give special awards, you know, honor where honor is due. Uh, I was thinking maybe if you wanted to, when the time comes, you could help me out with a little table drum roll or something so that we can, we can build up to the suspense of, of you know, just to see who gets the award. Also, as I go to, um, to each one of these awards, I'm going to announce what they are. I want you to think in your own mind. Try to guess. You can look at the paper, too, but try to guess which king you think we're go I'm about to say that's going to win this specific award. Now, I want you to understand some of this is subjective. It's kind of based on my opinion, so don't take it as gospel or anything. But uh, I still want to, I, I just wanted you to know that. But, so the uh, very first king that I would like to highlight for us today as um, getting an award, this king earns the biggest loser of a king award. Biggest Loser King Award goes to, and then we'll drop it. Rehoboam. Rehoboam, we would call the biggest loser king of them all. Did anyone guess that already? Anyone know who's going to say that? All right, do you know why I'm going to say he's the biggest loser king of them all? No, because, like, um, lost everything. <laughs> <laughs> he lost a lot. Yeah, you're going to continue. He's the one that got the kingdoms divided because of his answer to the elders of all. Yes, exactly. We have a young, foolish king. His dad was the wisest king of all time. King Solomon, David's son, got to build the temple, collected enormous amounts of money. And by the way, we didn't get to it, but I wanted you guys to realize King David, from what I can tell, set aside most of the money to build the temple. Solomon's wages were 660 something talents of gold a year. And a talent is a massive amount. So lots, that was his wages per year. But if you read, David set aside thousands and thousands and thousands of talents of gold, silver, and other stuff for the preparation of the building of the temple. So David unloaded a bunch of money there. But anyway, Solomon was the wise one. But in order to build the temple, what do you got to do? You got to have skilled workers, you got to have workforce, you got to have labor. Taxes, you got to get that money and everything. And the people loved their king so much, they were happy to pay taxes. But after the lifetime of Solomon, he died. His son Rehoboam becomes king. The people have decided, we've had enough. We can't take any more taxes. So they come to Rehoboam and they say, hey, lower, lower the tax rate. Lighten the load. This is too much work. And Rehoboam had a chance, yeah? I'd say it could have been worse. They could have probably had to have permits. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> I mean, you know, good point there. Um, so Rehoboam... Uh, said, give me a minute, I'm going to get back to you. And he consulted the wise men who served around Solomon. Now, Solomon, wisest guy who ever there was, uh, wisest guy who was, the only thing brought, that brought him down was uh, his love of women. He was an idiot when it came to that. But uh, so <laughs> Rehoboam thought, well, I'm going to ask the guys who are around Solomon. They are pretty knowledgeable people. They should know a thing or two. And they advised them. What was their advice? The summary of these guys' advice? Lower taxes. Do it. If you are nice to these people, they will be nice to you. You need to make that great first impression. But then it says he kind of rejected their advice. He didn't want to hear that. So he went to his buddies. He went to the younger guys. What do you think I should do? And they said, oh, this is your chance to stand up for yourself. You know, Everyone thought Solomon was great. You need to make a name for yourself, and you need to stand up even stronger. And they gave him this wonderful speech. My little finger is thicker than my father's waste. My father beat you with whips, I'll beat you with scorpions. Oh, you know, I can just see him talking about how uh, amazing of a guy he thought he was. Then next time he went to collect taxes from the north, they killed the tax collector. And he ran away. And from then on, 10 of the 12 tribes split off. So 10 out of 12, I don't know what percentage is that. <laughs> We're over 80%. He, he's a big time loser. Biggest loser. He lost the kingdom, but God said, hey, don't go to war against each other. This is what I had planned. And the kingdom went uh, north and south. So we have the northern kingdom, which is called what? What is the nation 
called Israel. Israel. And then down in the south, the two tribes left, we refer to as Judah. Judah, exactly. So that Rehoboam wins our biggest loser award. Uh, next award is going to be the Bad King Award. So, the Bad King Award goes to... Jeroboam wins our Bad King Award. King Jeroboam. Now, who is King Jeroboam? King Jeroboam was the first king in the north. He was the one that the prophet actually came to him with, uh, I believe it was this time, he had, he had his robe torn into 12 pieces and he gave 10 of them to Jeroboam. He said, God's going to make you king of these 10 tribes. So right off the bat, the guy could have done great things for God, but instead he, he thought of himself. He thought, we have a serious problem here because the temple, the place where people worship, the Ark of the Covenant, is in Jerusalem, in Judah. And I don't own Judah. And what's going to happen? Over time, people are going to come down for every feast like they're supposed to. They're going to worship. And they're going to pledge their allegiance back to Judah again. I can't have that. I'm going to lose all the tribes right back to them. So we've got to figure out what we're going to do. And he came up with his great idea. And you've got to be careful. A lot of times we Christians, especially church leaders, have great ideas. But sometimes... A great idea is not biblical, and it's just you're only thinking practical, you know. This seemed very practical, but it was definitely not biblical. He set up two of his own centers of worship, two golden calves. Now, when, when you think of golden calves, um, when you think of that, a lot of times you uh, it's easy to think how pagan it seems and how perverted. But I hope we realize that a lot of times... Um, what they're really trying to do is just make something as beautiful as they know how to make it so that they can, and, and they weren't dumb enough to say, this calf saved me, oh, this cow is, real. holy cow. <laughs> they, they, weren't, they weren't that dumb. <laughs> they were using this as a representation, something that they could see to picture a God that they can't see. That's why there are, there's the first two of the Ten Commandments, no other gods is the first one, and then the second one is no idols. Isn't that a little redundant? If there's no other gods, of course you wouldn't have idols. Well, the difference is an idol is something that you use, that you don't worship it in and of itself. You use it to gain access to the real God. I had a, uh, a kid who was a leader in the Catholic Church really trying to give me a, 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 a speech about Mary, and, and he kept saying that, uh, you know, people misunderstand, you know, we pray to Mary. We don't really pray to Mary. We, we, Mary is just kind of an intercessor. We talk to her, but we're really praying to God. And uh, what he didn't know is that the, everything he described fit perfectly with the second commandment. No idols. That's exactly what an idol is. It's something that you don't really care that much about. It. It's what it represents. You know, using an image to represent God is exactly what he's talking about. Jeroboam decided, oh, I'll just do that. And then he, he told the people, worship can be more convenient. You know what? You don't always have to travel so far to get to church. God doesn't care that much. I've decided to plant a special <coughs> church really close to you. I've got one in the north and one in the south, so you have a nice close trip wherever you go. You don't even have to leave the comfort of your own territory. <laughs> and he did. But while he was in the middle of one of those uh, sacrifices at one of his uh, altars, I believe it was the one in Dan, a prophet comes in and interrupts the service. And this prophet prophesies and he says, altar, altar. <laughs> Yelling out to this altar that they have in front. And he basically says, someday there's going, and he names them by name. He said, there is going to be a godly king named Josiah. This is hundreds of years before a guy named Josiah ever showed up, but he named him. There's going to be a godly king by the name of Josiah, and he's going to deal with you and get rid of this horrible worship. And it was right at that time that uh, Jeroboam was ready to, I mean, he was angry. He was, he was really angry. And so he stretched out his hand to seize that prophet. And what happened? Does anyone remember? Yeah, it's still good. Nasty hand. Gross hand. Yeah, and then all of a sudden it's, Pray for me, please. <laughs> so he was caught. But 
even so, that was what he did. And the reason why we're going to call him a bad king is actually a biblical reason. Because God uses, I mean, we know we're not supposed to compare ourselves to others as far as um, measuring our holiness or whatever. But God uses him as a standard of evil. It's as though God's got evil measuring tape, and the first link on it is, oh, Jeroboam level of evilness right there. And you'll find out after Jeroboam, you see on your list, you've got Nadab, you have Baasha, you have Elah, you have Zimri. It just keeps going on down the list. What kind of king were they? Bad, 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 bad. And you know how the Bible says it? They were bad. They continued in the sins of Jeroboam. That Baasha, he was... He, he, he did not repent. He continued in the sins of Jeroboam. And it just keeps using Jeroboam as the wicked standard. So the really bad king award, or the bad king award is going to go to Jeroboam because he set the first evil standard of kings. And it's a shame because he was the very first one. So we go from the bad king award to next up, the really bad king award. We have a light drum roll, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. The really bad king is Ahab. Ahab. Excellent. Excellent. You guys got it. King Ahab. Now, Ahab uh, was a captain of this ship with a giant whale named Moby. That was good. Um, Ahab was, uh, <coughs> was a new standard of evil. And uh, this guy, Ahab, what a whip. A whip in various ways, but... One of the ways that he proved himself to be a wimp and to prove himself to be more evil is by the wife that he chose to marry who introduced Baal worship. Baal worship is, is uh, this foreign god who was used to um, uh, control things that came from the sky, basically. Fertility, you know, health, stuff like that, the crops. So what better way to really smack in the face of the false god Baal than to have a prophet named Elijah show up and pray, God, stop the rain. Just like God said in, in the Pentateuch, in the first five books, he said, hey, if my people reject me, then I'll hold back the rain. So Elijah prays that biblical prayer, and for three and a half years, no rain. Well, shouldn't people get it? I mean, you're worshiping the god that brings rain, and then all of a sudden it quits raining, and you have this big drought. So why do people get it? Well, I would like to offer my theory of why Baal worship uh, was able to continue so well. And it's unfortunate, but it is because sex sells. That is my theory, because even back then, the idea of fertility, that can be a very sexual idea. And so the female counterpart to Baal was this wicked goddess, Asherah. And she was a she was kind of a figurine pole kind of looking thing, and they would exaggerate the sexual parts, and and they sexualized the worship basically. So you got prostitution, you got other things going on too. So people aren't really thinking that clearly about about what they're actually doing. They're emotionally just getting swept in to this kind of worship. Unfortunately, that's how Satan gets a lot of people today. Some of the most godly people. He's it's, it's very strong. So that is probably one of the main reasons why Baal worship continued to be prevalent even though there's no rain. And then you hear about this famous contest on Mount Carmel. Remember the name Mount Carmel? Brings good thoughts to like Carmel. <laughs> and uh, uh, that famous contest where the prophets of Baal, the 450 prophets of Baal, and the 400 prophets of Asherah, too, I think, were there. And they were, you know, they had their chance to call down fire from heaven and light up their altar. And they cried out and they cried out and they thought, well, maybe we cut ourselves. You know, so they start slashing themselves. Bam, don't you feel bad for us? You know, do something. And Elijah, the prophet, is mocking them the whole time. And basically, some versions say it different, but it's almost as though Elijah is really being kind of mean. He's saying, like, I'm sorry, did, did Baal go to the restroom? Is he in the bathroom? He sure has taken a long time if he is. I mean, he... He's making fun of their God. And then when it comes his time, God answers, just boom, fire from heaven. And everyone is scared to death, as they rightfully should be. So Ahab definitely uh, wins the really bad king award. What does that mean? Kings after Ahab, such as Ahaziah, Joram, Jehu, others, whenever their, command, whenever their 
pictured as bad, they are now compared to Ahab. Because Ahab is the new standard of evil, the one who did more evil than Jeroboam before him. So sort of like the evil ruler, you know, the second link, second foot on the evil ruler is now Ahab. So he gets the really bad award. Next award is coupled right with this one. We don't even need a drum roll for it because you already know. Who wins the evil queen award? <laughs> queen Jezebel. Why does she win the evil queen award? Well, Baal worship. She was evil. You talk about sexualized uh, worship. Even until her final day, when everything was coming to an end, she is up there, and there's another king out there, troops, say, you know, uh, coming to kill her, and she's putting on makeup. She's like, I'm still young enough. I'm going to make myself look good. And she, she responds. To, she hopes her sexuality will save her, and it doesn't. It doesn't. So that's the kind of lady she was. Also, the reason why she wins the Evil Queen Award is this is way back in, you know, earlier parts of Scripture. Fast forward all the way to the book of Revelation, and she's still there. She is not only a standard of evil in the Old Testament, she has now become a standard of evil in general for people in the New Testament and Christians today. You want to talk about evil? You can talk about Jezebel, which is sad because you think Jezebel is not a bad sounding name, but... She's kind of ruined it for a lot of people. So it would, it would kind of be cruel, I think, for most people to name their child Jezebel now. So anyway, Evil Queen Award goes to Jezebel. Not the worst Queen Award. The Evil Queen Award. But we'll digress. Let's jump to another king. This king wins the Worst Driver Award. Worst Driver Award. Can we please have a really light drum roll, please? And the winner is Jehu, son of Nimshi. Jehu, son of Nimshi. Jehu's got quite an interesting story. Um, the reason why he wins the Worst Driver Award, though, is because there is a situation where people are uh, in a palace, they're looking out, and they're trying to figure out there's somebody coming in a chariot. Who is coming? Way, way, way in the distance. And somebody makes this statement, and it's recorded in scripture for us. He says, the driving is like that of Jehu, son of Nimshi. Quote, he drives like a madman. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be great for you to go down in scripture as the one who drove like a madman? Even before the days of cars, this guy could take a chariot, and he drives it like a madman. So Jehu wins the worst driver award of them all. However, as funny as I think that is, there are some good lessons that we can learn from God is like Jehu. Um, plenty. I, I, I want to skip back. Um, the line that Jehu started on, we're up in the north. We're still dealing with northern kings. Who was the very first standard of evil in the north? Jeroboam. Jeroboam. That very first standard of evil, that one story that is associated with him that is so powerful, we all have to know it, and I think we do, is the only good person in his family. There is a recorded the birth, soon to be birth of a child that was going to be born into Jeroboam's family. And the prophet said about this child that that child's going to die. But the reason why, it's, it, it says it this way, that the child that you're having shall die. He is the only one in the whole house of Jeroboam that the Lord has found favor in. He is the only, so you put those two together, you stop and you think, wait, the child's going to die because he's the only good child? Now, euthanasia or anything like that, the right to kill is not our right to have. However, if we were God, if we knew everything, and we could see the entire future, past, present, everything, and we created life, that is God's right. And sometimes, that clues us in, sometimes when God takes somebody's life prematurely, sometimes it could be because they actually were good. They actually were uh, being spared from some great thing that was going to happen in life because God cared that much about them that he allowed it to happen. And that's the example that we have in the family of Jeroboam. If the child had lived, he would have grown up and had a very hard life. And God said, no, you don't deserve that. You just come home. Now, if you hold to a 
a position that it that that says that children are born in sin, um, that they are born with a need to be baptized immediately because they are born with the sin of Adam and they're going to go to hell. You have a real problem, especially with scriptures like that. Uh, I, however, don't see any need to adopt that position because I don't see any biblical precedent for it. I think Romans is clear that whatever sin came into the world through Adam was more than taken care of on the cross, and now it's just our own sins that we're accountable for. Well, the only way you can be accountable for your own sin is you have to be aware of sin. That, that's why there's the laws of nature, the laws of conscience. There are some things that clue you into the fact that, oh, I shouldn't be doing this. Oh, responsibility. And that's why repentance is part of it. That's Jeroboam. Now when we come to Jehu, he's not only a mad driver. He is zealous in everything he does. His driving fits his personality because he is hardcore to the max. But he was entrusted with something. And it, it, these, things, these things are really cool, these little tricks, that, these little things that God, nuggets of wisdom that God shares with us. Uh, he was entrusted with the duty to destroy Ahab's household. He's a judge. He's an executioner sent by God. Now, it's important to understand killing is never allowed. Murder is never allowed unless it is authorized by the authority, by God or by a government that he's allowed to be in authority in that position. So Jehu is given this commission from God that he is supposed to wipe out the family of Ahab because Ahab's family was so wicked. So when it comes to Queen Jezebel, Jehu was there in his chariot. He drove up. And there she is. Put, she put all her makeup on. She wants to seduce him. It's not going to work. And he calls out, hey, is anyone up there on our side? And the eunuchs, the people that, for obvious reasons, they were allowed to take care of the queen because they weren't worried about having anything bad happening, said, hey, yeah, we're on your side. And they said, fine, throw her down. Tossed her to the ground, and then he decided to drive that chariot and just <laughs> run her over a few times, let the dogs take, take care of the rest. I mean, nasty what he did. And there was another instance where... This light is just... <laughs> there's another instance where Jehu... Uh, got to, got another man to come in to his chariot. It's funny, I'm, I, have, I never actually made the connection how many times his chariot was brought up. And I wondered if the other guy was scared the whole time he was riding with him. But this Jehu said, hey, come here. I want you to see my zeal for the Lord. I want you to see how passionate I am to do what God wants me to do. And he shows them all that he's doing. Hardcore to the max, but the way that he was that way, uh, uh, that's how the way that he was was a problem. As a matter of fact, he had this really great idea for getting rid of Baal worship, and it did work. He said, when he became king, he said, you know what? Ahab, Jezebel, they worship Baal a little. Not me. Jehu worships Baal a lot. We're going to have the biggest Baal worship gathering there ever was. Spread the word. And so he got all the people who were still faithful to the false god Baal to meet together in one place until they had a huge group. And once they were all together, he turned to his soldiers, kill them all. And they did, they slaughtered them. Now when it comes to the end of Jehu's life, somebody like that, um, they've taken care of the checklist. You know, boom, boom, boom. I'm using these new markers, but I'm not really even using them. So I'm just holding them up to say thank you for getting these markers. Checked off the list of the things he's supposed to do. Took care of that, took care of that, took care of that, took care of that. He wiped out Ahab's family. He wiped out Baal worship. He was zealous. And God punishes him. Well, that doesn't sound too fair, does it? Why punish somebody for doing what you asked them to do? Well, the best conclusion is, well, I, the conclusion that I think follows is not, it's not so much what he did but it's the way he went about doing it. This guy probably enjoyed all the massacring that he did. He probably enjoyed all the killing that uh, he got to do and use it in the name of God. And instead of giving God the humble respect, you know, God loves life. He is the author of life. He commands there to be respect for life. So for somebody to disrespect that is not having the same kind of heart that God wants. Even if, you, even if you are tasked with being the person who is the executioner, 
I'm hoping that's not something you just do lightly, like it's no big deal. I, I'm hoping that everyone would, would at least kind of take a pause and recognize this is a very serious thing that's happening here. Jehu did not honor God in the way he went about doing what God asked him to do. And as a result, God says, I'm going to punish you for that. Now, if this helps, I don't know if it will, but there's another man that was a very godly man, but he made the same kind of mistake of not honoring God in front of the people. And because of that, he was punished pretty severely for him, too. Do you remember who this man was? Moses. The man Moses. Yeah. And what was what was his mistake? What did he do? He just didn't mean about that. He was frustrated. He, he, he basically, you know, God said, all right, the people are complaining. They want water again. We'll strike the rock, you know, and uh, water will come out for them. But Moses, it's as though he's so frustrated and upset. He's like, shall I deal with you guys again? Always needing water. Wham! Hits the rock. It's as though in a big fluster, he mindlessly went in and did kind of the thing that God told him to do. But later on, God pulls him aside and says, you did not respect me in front of my people. And because of that, you do not get to go into that promised land, that one that you've been waiting your whole life to see. That's a pretty big punishment, too. And it's not necessarily anything he did so much as the way he went about doing it. So that's the lesson we get from Moses. It's also the lesson we get from Jehu. Obedience is not enough. You need to obey the right way. You need to obey the way God wants you to obey. And that's why I think a good example in the New Testament you're supposed to speak the truth. How? How do you speak the truth? In love. If you didn't speak the truth in love, did you obey? <clears throat> you did not obey. You may have spoken true words, but if those words were not in love, it's just like someone who brags about themselves, and they say, well, I'm telling the truth. Or who insults somebody else, well, I'm telling the truth. And you might be telling the truth. It doesn't make it okay to bring up at that moment. So, worst driver award goes to Jehu, son of Nimshi, and we learn some interesting lessons from his life. Got to move on, though. Next is the worst choice of friends. The worst choice of friendship award goes to... I want you guys to think about this. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. The winner is Jehoshaphat. I always, I always used to call him Jehoshaphat. But Jehoshaphat is kind of how his name is spelled. Worst choice of friend. Now, we, when we go to him, what I just did, I tricked you guys. I'm sorry about that. Jehoshaphat is going to be one of the kings of Judah. One of the kings of Judah. The reason why I mentally threw him in right here is because he got buddy-buddy with King Ahab. He, he made the worst choice of friend, and you should have known you chose a bad friend when that king Ahab says, hey, you know what, listen, we got to go to war, let's lie together. I'll dress like a soldier, and you dress up like a king. <laughs> we'll just go our separate way. That should have, should have clued him into something right there, like, what's up with you? What's going on? And he almost gets killed because Ahab got him to be a diversion, but... Yeah, a decoy, exactly. So he, he gets the worst choice of friend. The reason why I'm bringing him up is because he's listed as a good king. And the Bible speaks of him that way. He was a good king. But bad company corrupts good character. He, ch he chose to be around bad company, and he suffered for it. So Jehoshaphat gets the, uh, the worst friendship choice award. Now I'm going to get back into... Uh, the kings of Israel again. This is around the confusing time where the two lines have just merged. Jehoshaphat and some of his family was related to Ahab and some of his, some of his family. And so the intermarriage has brought the lines together. And that's where the confusion has started to happen. And somebody seizes the day at this moment. This award is the really evil queen award. Not evil. The really evil queen award. Really evil queen award goes to this person who I always thought I knew how to pronounce the name, but then one of my professors explained, no, 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 that's not how you pronounce the name. The name is pronounced, <clears throat> do this way, Thaliah. <laughs> ah, Thaliah. Yep. It's 
sounds a lot like Athaliah, but it is Athaliah. Every time you say it, you're supposed to, to bow puke, you know, really just be disgusted at who this lady was. Why does Athaliah get the really evil queen award? What on earth, uh, what on earth caused that? She was an opportunist. Remember the opportunist we spent a lot of time talking about? It was um, Absalom. He was waiting for his chance. She was the queen mother, actually the queen grandmother in this case. And there came a time where there was so much war and turmoil going on that the kingship was really weak. And so she seized the throne for a couple of years. She stepped in as queen and she ruled the nation. And what did she do that makes her so wicked? Well, it's bad enough that she stepped in. Then she said, I'm going to find every correct descendant that should be king and execute them as fast as I possibly can. And so she destroyed all the descendants who were supposed to be in the line of the king, except she missed one because this one was hidden away by some godly people. But because of that, she was a really evil lady. And what's interesting is... When you look at somebody like her, and there are some other instances too, the prophecy that Jesus was going to come from the line of David was almost put out right there. This woman almost killed the line of David. She just barely, narrowly escaped. And there are some other times where that happens too. You wonder, like, God, do you really know what you're, what you're doing here? Do you, do you really under, <laughs> are you really letting this happen? Yeah, he is, but he still uh, made provision. So really evil queen award goes to Athaliah, followed by the youngest king award. The youngest king is a man named, anyone get, want to guess? Joash. Joash. Joash is right. Joash gets the young king award. Seven years old when he becomes king. Why so young? Why, why start such, such a young king? He's the only one left. Athaliah had killed all the others. And we needed a godly king to take her place. We got, had to get her out of there. And, and she, she went out screaming, kicking and screaming, literally, if you read what the Bible says about her. She went out. And so all that's left is Joash. Joash is only seven years old, but with the council of uh, priests, people with him, he ruled. And guess what? He was a good king. He was a good king. You don't even have to be that old necessarily to do what's right. Um, and Joash was one of the kings of the south um, right there that kind of stepped in. So now we've gone through, I believe I'm done with all the kings of the north. So now I'm just going to be focusing on the remainder of time on the kings of Judah. We've already made it up to Joash. So... You have a short list. Well, actually, it's not that short. There's some more coming. This next king gets the award for the most lethal king. Most deadly of all kings. This, this one might be a surprise. I'm curious to see how many people know this. Anyone want to take a stab, take a guess at who you think the most lethal king is? What's that? What's that? What's that? No, you're not far off, though. The most lethal king award goes to a man by the name of Uzziah. Uzziah. Why do I say most, most lethal king award? I'm not talking about spiritually lethal. I'm talking about physically. The reputation that he had was building weapons. King Uzziah, which, by the way, this is right around the time of the book of Isaiah. When you read about the call of Isaiah, he says it was in the reign, during the reign of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah. Uzziah, I remember him as the Uzi. <laughs> the Uzi, because he was known for his weaponry. He made all kinds of, uh, actually it was, uh, the way it's described, I don't know the details of it, but it's described as though he sat and he thought and he, he made contraptions. He didn't just make, oh yeah, you know, a big club, hurt people, smash. No. It wasn't that kind of thing. It was cleverly devised uh, machines that he would take in warfare. And the reason why I think that's significant is because he made, he made a blunder of a mistake. He had built up so much warfare, uh, art, instruments of war, that I personally think that that 
messed with his head a little bit to where he thought he was something special. Because he decided, I don't want priests offering incense for me. I want to go in and I want to do it myself. And so he walked into the temple and the priests bravely said, Uzziah, what are you doing? Get out of here. You are not supposed to be in here. God has his ways. He said, priests only in here. But Uzziah throws them aside and he's going in there no matter what. And God strikes him with leprosy. Strikes him with leprosy. And I mean, head to toe, he's covered and he's freaked out. He's ready to leave. Now, what happens at that point? Well, at that point, he's not really able to reign anymore because when somebody's got this bad skin disease, they have to be quarantined. So he can't enjoy the nice palace, can't enjoy all the nice weapons, can't enjoy all that wonderful stuff that he had built up. Why was he called a good king? Because he was good in a lot of other ways. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you're you're right. I'm glad you mentioned that because... Overall, he was a good king, but at the end, he he messed up. I, I'm going to imagine that he spent a lot of time in repentance, too, when he was quarantined. And, um, but yeah, he was a good king that did fall to pride, and yeah, glad you brought that up. So, uh, that's Uzziah. This next award goes to the king who was the dumbest. The dumbest king award. The most stu- this is in my opinion the most stupidest, we can say it that way, the most stupidest of all the stupidity there could ever be for a king wrapped up in one person. This guy wins it. Dumbest King Award goes to yeah, this is good. Stupidity is the drunk hole. A man named Ahaz. Uzziah Jotham then Ahaz, right before Hezekiah. Why on earth would I say Ahaz gets the dumbest king award? I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because even though he was a bad king, even though he did turn to idolatry and do some other things, he was threatened with war. I believe it was the Syrians now, I think is who it was. And he was concerned about these Syrians, and everyone was. So God allowed the prophet to come visit him. And the prophet said, guess what? God's on your side. And he can defeat these Syrians, and he'll take care of them for you. And the way he even mentions it is he says it this way. To my knowledge, there's only one other time this happened in Scripture, and that was to King Solomon. He said to King Ahaz, what do you want? This is what the prophet said this. This is what the Lord says. What do you want from me? No matter how great this request is, just let me know. What is it you want God to do for you? And God will do it. He gets the almighty blank check. And he said, what do you want? Just let me know and I'll do it. When Solomon had that blank check, what did he ask for? Wisdom. 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 And he got wisdom. He got wisdom better than anyone ever got So we know God's good for it. He really was anyway. And what does Ahaz say? I cannot test. He says, no. No. He said, now, don't don't be mistaken, you know, throwing those words out. I, I won't test the Lord. Listen. Yeah, it is wrong to put God to the test, to test him like that. But if God comes to you with a test, you don't refuse. You do not refuse. And he refused. He, in essence, said, God, I don't need you. And instead, he took gold and silver from the temple. He collected all he could, and he paid warriors to help him out in the war instead of taking God's offer. You really, I just don't see how you can get dumber than that. I really don't. So this guy wins the absolute stupidity award for sure. And it's such a sad thing, too. He could have been a great king with a story a lot like Solomon and a lot of the good that happened, but nope. Passed it all up because he wanted to be his own god. Didn't work out too well. Now, this next guy wins the Good King Award, and Good King is often part of his name. Good King what? Hezekiah. That's right. Hezekiah wins the Good King Award because he was a very godly king. 
Uh, it's great to have that kind of reputation. He removed all kinds of idols. He destroyed things that were once like the bronze serpent that Moses had um, built for the people who got bit by the snakes to look at. Well, they started worshiping it. It became that symbol that was a good thing became a symbol that became idolatry. And so he destroyed it because it was causing that kind of trouble, which is interesting um, in the church. A lot of good things can turn into idols if we're not careful. Some ministries are great ministries, but if you focus too much on ministry, you've now got an idol. Uh, case in point, I guess, would be a lot of the church today. In order to win people to Christ, we meet their needs. But then a lot of churches have accidentally gotten to the point where now all we do is meet their needs. We forget about Christ. It's, you know, it's not just a giant feeding program or something else. And you forgot to add the gospel, which is the main thing. So, very easy to do. Hezekiah made some mistakes in his lifetime. You know, just like you were saying about Uzziah. Even though he was a good king, he did, he did have some things that's just unfortunate that he did. It's frustrating. But overall, very good king. And the greatest, I believe, the greatest testimony to his faith was when Sennacherib of Assyria had conquered all of Judah. Everything except Jerusalem, and he surrounded the city of Jerusalem with this massive army. And even then, Hezekiah was scared to death, but he went to the temple. He spread out this threatening letter that he had got from Ram Shaka, the, the leader of Sennacherib's troops. And he prayed to God and said, God, this is all true. He can easily defeat me, but I'm trusting you. And the people had enough respect for him that they recognized, we're not going to cave in. We're going to stand by our king, even though we might die because all the other cities around in Judah have died. And God said, hey, don't you worry. I know where Sennacherib lives, and I know how to take care of him. And he threatened me, and that's the last thing he'll ever do. And then in the morning, 185,000, 185,000 Assyrian troops are all dead. King James Version, they woke up and lo, they were dead. <laughs> all dead. And then... Snacker, and by the way, God sent one angel to do that. One. We know that, that God has thousands and thousands, tens and tens of thousands of angels and beyond, and He only needs to send one to deal with 185,000 of these humans. Crazy, very crazy. Um, yeah, in, incredible. And then Snacker gets assassinated, so God dealt with him. So that's one of the greatest testimonies to Hezekiah's faith, because let's face it. You're on God's side, but everything except your last city has been taken out by the enemy. It's very tempting to run at that point. But he didn't. He didn't. Worst king ever. The baddest of the bad is a man named who? Who? Manasseh. Thing to note about Manasseh, he is, as far as idol worship, he is the top, he is the top level on our ruler of evil. He is the highest standard of wickedness. King Manasseh was worse than everyone before him, everyone after him. Awful. And he reigned the longest. Look at all the kings, and you'll find out at 55 years of reigning, he reigned the longest of all the kings. Just because circumstances go well for you on earth is not, is not a gauge for right or wrong. It's not a gauge that God's on your side, and Manasseh proves that. God is disgusted at what this guy does. But you know what? To make matters worse, and this would upset some Christians today probably if they really knew the guy well, at the very end of his life, he gets in a real tight spot and he um, ends up praying to God and he ends up repenting. And he only has moments left to live. I mean, when I say moments, he has a matter of months left while he's going to be alive. And he spends the last part of his life trying to undo all the evil that he caused in his 54 plus years of reign, it's nearly 55 years. And he can't do it. So it's a pathetic, sad story for an individual who spent his whole life in evil and then wakes up at the end and recognizes, oh man, and tries to undo but can't undo what they've already done. But presumably we will meet that man someday when we get to paradise. And we'll talk to him. And we will be happy for him because we all don't deserve to be there. We're all saved by grace. And what a great example of anyone 
anyone at all if they would just turn their life over to God. I mean, he, he was as bad as they get, and yet he repented. So there's no excuse for anyone else. Your sin is never that bad that God can't deal with it. It's not that way. It never is. So he gets that award. The greatest reforming king award goes to good king Josiah. Prophesied all those years earlier with Jeroboam. Now it comes true as a really young man. He gets rid of all kinds of idol worship. And good king Josiah is where we will end, sadly, the history of Israel does not end on a great note. Um, it ends, they started as a great, great kingdom, but then they end up as a very fragmented remnant of people who are left after the Assyrian attack, which destroyed Israel in the north, and then the Babylonian exile, which really removed most of Judah in the south. And all we're left with is this small remnant of people that survived and got to stay under the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Got to go back and got to stay in the land of Israel, but they were always under somebody like the Romans. When we get to the time of Jesus, the Romans are the real nation in control, but the Jews are allowed to live. But God had prophesied earlier that out of this small remnant, out of this little stump, this tiny little thing, that he will raise up something amazing. Uh, he, he, in one of the dreams of Nebuchadnezzar, he uses it as a the picture of a rock cut out, but not by human hands, that comes down and it pulverizes a statue that represents all the nations of the world that will come in the future. Boom! Destroys them all. And then it grows into a giant mountain. You and I are pieces of that mountain. That mountain is not the physical state of Israel today. That mountain is the church of God. That's the mountain. And guess what? The church of God can never die. They've tried to kill it. They can't. It's all over the world. It has literally overtaken the entire world, and it wins. That's what we're part of. So let's go ahead and pray for you. God, thank you so much that we get the privilege of being the church. Please help us to learn from, learn from the examples that you've given us in, in your word. Uh, so much that we just glossed right over tonight, God, but thank you that you have given us the details, sometimes even the gory details, because it helps us out. Um, help us to be good people and help us to learn from the mistakes that others have made, even people who are trying to serve you, but they still messed up along the way. God, thank you for your forgiveness and that you extended it to the worst of mankind. And that means there's hope for all of us. So thank you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to be combined for about a month. And then uh, we'll split up and have two classes again. So Dean's going to be teaching next Tuesday. And he'll continue. His class goes, I think, 12 weeks long. So after about four more weeks, I'll jump in with a Bible overview class. So that's what's going on. Sorry, I forgot to tell you. Thank you.